Welcome to Bloomberg Law. I'm Lee Pacquia. Over the course of 2011, New York Times reporter David Siegel wrote a series of articles about the state of legal education in America. He found that, despite the very tough job market for recent graduates, many law schools remain remarkably resistant to change, continuing to saddle their students with ever higher tuition payments and bigger debt loads. I'm happy to say we have David joining us today to discuss what he thinks needs changing in the legal education space. David, thanks so much for coming in. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, before we begin, I have to say uh, it's interesting. Your beat at the New York Times is actually not law or legal education. Right. It's consumer finance. How did you uh, come to uh, write this uh, series? Well, uh, the beginnings of this could not be uh, more banal. I met a guy um, uh, at a cocktail party who said that he just graduated from law school and that uh, though he had a job, none of his friends had jobs and that uh, nobody seemed to be aware that law schools continued to crank out graduates despite the fact that the law uh, market had dried up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just seemed like an interesting fact to me and uh, I, I just dove in from there and then just found out how in just crazy this, uh, the whole law school market is. Uh, the business of, of law school, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the madness uh, that is created by the U.S. News and World Report rankings, which uh, w just never seems to end and seems deeply, deeply ingrained and almost pathological. Um, and then all the sort of different shenanigans that the law schools use in order to uh, make the school seem more appealing, uh, to sort of cover up. They were kind of masking just how bad the job market mm -hmm. was. It was just a richer vein than I could have imagined. Mm. So talk to me about uh, U.S. News. There are a lot of publications out there that rank law schools, but U.S. News rankings, uh, by far and large, are the most powerful. Um, do they reflect or distort the priorities of American law schools, in your opinion? Well, I mean, they do some kind of good, I suppose, insofar as people want some kind of news or information about law schools. But um, law schools themselves have taken this to some place that is incredibly destructive. Um, and, and the race, the prestige race that has been sparked by U.S. News has led uh, uh, almost all law schools to uh, fudge a lot of, uh, of, of the figures, um, to, to uh, also set really uh, sad priorities. For instance, merit scholarships um, are uh, you get credit for those in U.S. news. What you don't get credit for is minority scholarships. So in fact, over the course of the last 10 years or so, minority scholarships have shrunk and merit scholarships, which allow schools to bring in higher LSAT, GPA students, have, have grown. Um, those are the perversities that have been created. To some extent, this is the fault of U.S. news because it has those sort of perversities built into it. But it doesn't help that law schools are just completely obedient to uh, these set of standards and, and jump through any hurdle that is uh, erected by U.S. News. Mm -hmm. But some of the law schools, I mean, we spoke to Dean Matazar from New York Law School, who, of course, you took on in one of your articles, uh, spoke to us, and he argued that uh, many deans, like himself, uh, don't really have any power outside of uh, the ABA to, to lower their tuition costs. Is he right in that? No, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would be surprised if it was the ABA that was preventing Dean Matasar from lowering his tuition because the mm -hmm. ABA did not. Well, he, he basically had the idea that it's a regulated industry and to some extent it's out of their hands. Right. What I'm saying is that it's not out of their hands to say build uh, an expensive multi-million dollar building, which is what Dean Matasar did. He spent a lot of money, uh, borrowed a lot of money and spent a lot of money to build uh, a new building. Um, it, like every other law school, Dean Matasar is involved in the prestige race that is associated with scholarship. So he's spending a lot of tuition money um, giving it to uh, scholars who are spending their time not teaching students, but writing uh, law review articles that will get published in prestigious uh, uh, journals. Now, that's not something that the ABA requires uh, uh, you know, in, in the way that Dean Matasar is doing it. The, what the ABA does is it sets a bottom, but it doesn't set a top. So, the ABA will compel a law school to charge a certain amount of money. You know, the lowest end might be like 28000 or so. But that doesn't explain why New York Law School charges 50000 New York Law School charges a, a little bit more than what Harvard charges. Um, and 
again, I don't think that's an ABA thing. I think there's a number of choices that he's making, which are all about competing in the U.S. news arena and competing for prestige. But that's, I mean, that the, the amount that NYLS charges is essentially a market rate that some students, uh, should they get into that institution, are, I wouldn't say they're happy to pay, but they're willing to pay it. What's wrong with that? Well, uh, you're totally right about that. This is a market, and that has been a, a, a defense of, of, of law schools. These are willing customers uh, who are adults, after all. They're all 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, the problem is that a lot of them don't know what they're doing. A lot of them don't understand what they're taking on. A lot of them don't appreciate what debt they're taking on. I mean, when you want to buy a, a house and you, you borrow... Um, you know, 150 or 175 or 200 thousand dollars. You're an adult, and you have an idea of what that will mean. That's a life investment, and you sit down, you have a long conversation about the ramifications of what that debt is. Almost none of these law students have any idea mm -hmm. uh, what they're getting into, and to some extent, the law schools really ought to patronize these students a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Does the it fall on the law schools to inform prospective students, or should it be some other regulatory body? I think that it, uh, th there's a combination here. I think that law schools should uh, uh, voluntarily make this information available. But, you know, the ABA this very recently started to uh, demand that law schools post information like the, the percent of students who lose their merit scholarships. Now, every law school knows what that percentage is already. I mean, it's not even that they have to do any research. It doesn't cost them anything. They know what that number is. Why don't they post it? Well. It might discourage people from taking that merit scholarship um, if they find out that they might lose it in year two and three. Uh, so yes, uh, at that point, if, uh, if schools are not willing to do it, and very few so far have, uh, it does behoove the ABA to step in and say, put that information on your website. Put it in the letter that you send them that says, the good news is you've gotten a merit scholarship. The bad news is, here's the chance, here's the number of people that got merit scholarships, and here's the chance you might lose yours. The ABA has come under a lot of criticism over the last three years. Uh, we'll call this period the, the great legal recession. Um, the criticism has been bifurcated from my vantage point into two camps. On one side of the spectrum, you have people that say, we have too many law schools out there. Stop accrediting new ones. You're just putting uh, young attorneys out into the marketplace for which there are no jobs. Uh, it's uh, leading to an unemployment problem. It's ultimately deflating wages. That's a problem. On the other hand, you have people who say, we actually need more law schools that create lawyers that are able to meet the legal servicing needs for the poor and middle class in America. If you put law schools out there that have uh, ultimately lower overhead, lower cost structures, mm -hmm. this would be a better way to go about. How do you come down in this debate? Should we have more law schools or fewer law schools coming online? Well, it depends on where you're looking at this debate. If you're a lawyer uh, from an ABA accredited school, you want the ABA to limit the number of law schools. Um, sure, it keeps wages higher. It keeps wages higher. It keeps prestige up, keeps wages higher. Um, if you're a consumer, um, you would like to have more options than just the gold standard, which is the ABA accredited lawyer. And in other countries, there are many different options. There are uh, all sorts of different price points for people that would like to get legal help. England, for instance, has about eight different ways to get legal advice. Uh, and that includes people who uh, have a degree that they get right out of high school after what is the equivalent of two years of community college. And they learn especially like how to handle a bankruptcy, a personal bankruptcy. If you have like a corporation, you don't want to hire someone who's gone to community college for two years. You want a, the gold standard lawyer. But in terms of the range of, 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 of uh, legal advice, it seems to me that from the consumer vantage point, that's what we should have, is mm -hmm. a number of different options. Mm -hmm. I understand why the ABA doesn't like the, that idea. And the ABA should not be the ones that create these other options, nor should they be ones accrediting or regulating them. Um, it's enough that they are both the um, trade group of the lawyers and the regulators of law schools and lawyers. Um, creating this a whole other genre, the other slice of, of, of uh, legal advice, should fall to the Department of Education. So for law schools, accreditation comes from the ABA, not the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. So how should the ABA adjust what it's doing? Should it be taken away from them entirely and, and given to another branch of the government? How does this conundrum get resolved? The, well, I mean, I think the Department of Education could get more involved. Um, they've never taken away the accrediting power <clears throat> of any of the uh, organizations that they have um, 
anointed to be the regulators of, of, uh, of various types of education. Um, uh, the, you know, the ABA has a, a terrible conflict of interest, namely its interest in uh, the legal profession and enhancing the prestige and the salaries. Of, of lawyers. It is, in fact, run by lawyers. All the people that are on these committees are essentially lawyers. Uh, after losing an antitrust fight back in 1995, they had to add a few more civilians uh, and non-lawyers uh, to these uh, councils and committees. But it's essentially dominated by lawyers still. And uh, that is just a, a recipe for um, a bunch of self-interested decisions. Mm. Going back to Congress for a minute, mm -hmm. some of the issues in your series have been uh, taken up by members of Congress, namely Senator Barbara Boxer from California mm -hmm. and Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa. Um, they've raised tough questions about how uh, student uh, law student debt uh, works and how ABA accredits law schools. What do you think the odds are that Congress will act to force change on legal a academia? I don't think they're very good, actually. Um, I mean, they've written a couple stern letters and those letters are published in publications that care about legal matters. Um, there was rumors that there would be hearings. Mm. Uh, I've not heard anything more about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I actually kind of think that um, there's not, that not much is going to happen. I think that mm. the, the ABA has been compelled a little bit. I think that they, uh, the, the, the senators helped to inspire the ABA to rethink some of uh, the reporting that the schools have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be the extent of, of reform uh, at law schools. What about the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau? Is that the wild card in this picture? Do you expect them to weigh in on any of these issues? You know, that's a great idea. I, I have no idea. I don't know enough about that bureau. It certainly seems like it would be no in one their does. wheelhouse. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and finally, applications this year, for the first time in a while, are down. Do you think people are starting to pick up on the ideas that you articulated in your series? I, I, I do think that, um, you know, for, for a, a long time, the received wisdom was law school would be a good place to sit out a recession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that that idea um, is, is not holding true. And I think that the legal market has been bad enough for long enough that people have started to rethink that idea. Does a decline in applications begin to solve the problems outlined in your series? It could. It could, actually. Um, that might be just what we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, what is, what's the downside for law schools? Um, they, they will, you know, the applications are down. What they could do is lower their standards, uh, which is unpleasant for them, but mm. not financially catastrophic. Um, you know, they're still uh, insulated insofar as um, there's lots of student loan money available for these kids. It's not like um, the, the, the well of cash is dried up for them. They still are, are in business. They, the, the, the worst that can happen is that they have to start taking kids with lower LSATs unless they say, okay, we, we don't want to lower our standards. Um, that's more important to us than financial viability. But I have a hard time feel, thinking that that's a trade-off that they will make. I think that most of them will opt for financial viability. And there's a really good chance that things will just sort of continue in, in the same way. I mean, people have been predicting that a revolution, uh, that a catastrophe is coming to law schools for more than a decade. Richard Matasar has mm -hmm. been among the loudest. And it just has not happened. All right, it's like the demise of the billable hour. It's still with us. That's exactly right. David, thank you so much for coming in. This was a pleasure. Thank Our you pleasure. for your time. Thank you. That's David Siegel. He's a reporter for the New York Times. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.